and that is what I do. Come in, I get the job done. I work hard, um, I support the people in the communities that I represent and also pass good policy. Okay, for Franklin Matters, Franklin Public Radio, anywhere, anytime on the internet at WFPR.FM and in the local Franklin Mass FM radio dial 102.9 here with a virtual discussion with our state senator, Becca Rausch. Becca, how are you doing today? I am doing so well, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing well. You know, I get to have all kinds of this kind of fun stuff. I talk to people either in person or remote and I change topics. Um, it, it's all good. There's a whole like lot that. happening. Yeah, it's never boring. <laughs> and there's a campaign season, I think, right? <laughs> yes, we do have, I, I seem to recall something about a very important election coming up. Um, a whole slate of really important races. Um, of course, starting at the top of the ticket with um, Vice President Harris and Governor uh, Tim Walls, uh, hopefully our next president and vice president of the United States. Um, as I sit in my campaign office and look at a poster of Kamala Harris on the wall um, with the big word freedom right across the top, it's uh, mm. it's very inspiring. Um, and, and a whole bunch of really important races here in the Commonwealth as well, um, including for United States Senate and also my race for re-election um, to continue serving as Franklin's state senator. I can hardly believe it's been the better part of a decade already that I have been serving this wonderful community. Um, so honored to be able to do this good work, um, especially to do it alongside my friend and colleague, Jeff Roy. Um, and we make such a great team and we have done so many wonderful things for the town of Franklin specifically um, and also broadly from a policy perspective um, that, of course, uplifts Franklin, but but also uplifts um, all the other towns and, and cities in the state. Uh, so we uh, we are both working hard and um, and hoping to earn the votes to uh, to secure reelection in less than 30 days, 20 mm -hmm. something Time, time is ticking. Days are rolling by. Yes. They, they go so fast. <laughs> they do. They do. And we were just reminiscing, you know, on a Friday in 2020, we were on a con town common and having our conversation interrupted by the band tuning up for playing concerts on the common later. So <laughs> as a former band player myself, I really appreciated that experience. And I actually just met my my oldest, um, who is 10, um, auditioned for for the honors band in our town of Needham and, and made it. Uh, so we're, we're continuing the band tradition. <laughs> Congratulations and best wishes definitely on that front. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think that gives us a chance to segue as I like to do from time to time into some of your priorities, which certainly from my perspective, I would simplify in terms of say women's and family, but overall health and certainly picking up on freedom and certainly democracy related to that. And you, while we don't have to go through all, you can certainly cover whatever the priorities you want to really want to highlight, but people can certainly find either on your page or your newsletters or your social channel, a lot of the other details. So we want to take this opportunity to kind of get behind some of those because the sound bites, okay, they'll go through, but we have the chance and you have the chance here to get behind that. Yeah, to really dig into the details, which I uh, I love, right? The details, the details are what make it great. The details are what make it great. Um, so uh, lots of big wins this session, um, both on the funding side and the community support side, and also on the policy side. Um, and since we were just talking about band and music and the arts, um, I'll start there. Um, I have filed a bill at the beginning of this term to create a choreographer laureate program in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, I'm a, a former dancer and choreographer myself. Uh, in fact, I still do some choreography on, on the side um, as a community engagement effort. And uh, it's so wonderful to work with families and, and students and um, provide a platform that's you know completely different from what you get in school or certainly what I see in the state house. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a great way to interact. 
um, and also to do some physical activity. Um, so I filed that bill back in January of last year, and a colleague of mine, a Republican colleague of mine, actually um, filed uh, a, a complimentary bill to create a musician laureate position in Massachusetts. And so the two of us got together um, and working in, in true bipartisan fashion, um, crafted uh, kind of a, a the beginnings of an arts laureates program for the state based on the two pieces of legislation that we had initially filed, um, one for the choreographer, one for the musician. And we were able to uh, pass that through the Senate as part of our economic development bill. It would be a huge uh, strengthening for the creative economy. It would boost mm -hmm. tourism and also would enhance communities through the arts, right? And the arts have a way of doing that in a way, well, in an unparalleled way, really. Right. Yeah. Um, Lots of dominoes fall that way. Yes. Yeah. And it's really, it's really something. It's really fantastic. And frankly, it, it makes me think about when, um, when Franklin became a cultural arts district. Yes. And it was so fantastic and so wonderful. And so many great things have come from that. Um, and it's kind of a microcosm of what we could be doing across the entirety of the state, not just for our, our cultural arts districts, um, but for every community. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, my Republican colleague and I got together and put this sort of mini package together and we were able to pass that um, through an amendment to the economic development bill. Um, so we continue to hope that that bill is going to get fully negotiated and come to fruition, hopefully in the coming days or mm -hmm. weeks. <laughs> Before the year end. <laughs> sometime soon uh and uh, that would be really terrific um in fact the the proposals have already gotten national press coverage um right. from the from the dance perspective uh we would be the first in the nation to create a choreographer laureate position which is not the first time we've done something first so i mean one of hopefully many good i mean certainly many good firsts have come before this would be another good first and hopefully just one in a long line of good firsts to come. Um, so that's just, you know, one of the, of the bills that I've been able to successfully advance. Right. I, I think people are always looking not for complaining, but for solutions. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that is what I do come in, I get the job done. I work hard, um, I support the people in the communities that I represent and also pass good policy at the same time. So we've got this, uh, economy and arts piece, multiple pieces passed in the healthcare uh, sector, broadly speaking, um, two specifically, uh, two bills um, that got merged together in the legislative process, um, specifically on health sector oversight and accountability improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, one that is laser focused on cost oversight. Um, it's a huge issue for so many people um, in Franklin and, and frankly, in, in all of the communities that I represent. Two bills there, um, and then several more in the healthcare and reproductive justice space. Um, one to make it easier for parents and caregivers to get their kids to the pediatrician. <laughs> that is that is actually an important part of that. Some from time to time, especially with younger kids, it's required. <laughs> yeah, it, it's required all throughout um, childhood. Um, and frankly, we grownups should go to the doctor once a year too. put a little plug in there for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yep. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm the only mom of kids 10 and under in the entirety of the Senate right now. And um, so I know from personal experience that sometimes it can be really difficult to get your kids to the pediatrician. And um, some insurance companies have been providing well child pediatric visits, mm -hmm. like check your annual physical, they provide coverage for that once every 12 months. Mm. Which really means 12 months plus one day, right? So right. if you go on, what's today? Today's October 10th that we're recording this uh, this segment. If I take my child to the pediatrician on October 10th and my insurer covers um, well child pediatric, you know, annual physicals once every 12 months, next year I can't go again until October 11th, right? right? And then the following year, I can't go until October 12th and then October 13th, right? And if you have to cancel or postpone an appointment at any point, you can never get back on track. And we saw hundreds of thousands of families get off track, mm -hmm. for example, COVID. Certainly. Right? Um, and there are other insurance companies that provide pediatric well-child visit coverage 
once per calendar year. Doesn't change the bottom line for any insurance companies. You're still paying for the for one visit per year. Mm -hmm. It's just a way of measuring what a year is. Yeah. Uh, and it makes so much more sense, right? Because you don't have to keep getting farther and farther and farther away from your child's birthday. You can right. just go once yeah. per calendar year. Um, so I wrote a bill and filed it. Uh, I filed the first last session and and this session I'm honored to and really proud to say we've passed that into law. So that is terrific. Uh, so we can check that one off as a big win also. Um, another big one, um, my legislation to provide licensure for midwives, certified professional midwives. These are the midwives that provide care in birth centers and in people's homes. Mm -hmm. so a huge spike in demand for home birth care during COVID, no surprise. No surprise. Uh, and the, but the really interesting part that frankly was a little bit of a surprise is that that demand level didn't drop back down after the pandemic period concluded. People still want that kind of care. And it was actually one of the cornerstone recommendations of the commission to address um, racial inequities in maternal health. Mm -hmm provide licensure for certified professional midwives. I've been filing this bill for a number of years. Um, the Senate had actually passed it unanimously in my first term, um, but unfortunately we couldn't get it quite over the finish line that session. And now that is law. Massachusetts has become the 39th state in the nation to provide a path to licensure for CPMs. Um, and that is a massive step forward for maternal health um, and for uh, particularly equity in maternal health. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a, a really central piece of the uh, midwives and maternal health bill that the governor signed in August. I've also passed a portion of my legislation to ensure that all post-pregnancy patients, not just those patients who become parents, right, moms, um, actually have access to and are even considered for um, post-pregnancy mental health care. That's... Uh, Something that should have been more well recognized, I think, before, but yeah. certainly it's an issue, and as big or little, it needs to be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. The you know the the hormones are real, regardless of how a pregnancy ends, and we know uh, we know that not all pregnancies result in no. babies. I I have truthfully lost count of the number of people who have spoken with me um, really bravely and courageously about mm -hmm. experience through miscarriage. And that takes an incredible emotional toll, let alone the physical toll. Um, but the screenings for postpartum depression have always happened at pediatric offices. You are not going to a pediatrician if you have survived through a miscarriage. Um, so uh, taking that kind of holistic approach and vision to all post-pregnancy patients, um, that that vision is now law in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, all post-pregnancy patients must be screened for postpartum depression um, and post-pregnancy mental health needs, not just at the pediatrician, but at all sites of care. Mm -hmm. That is a massive, massive step forward. Yeah, I think that's one key aspect of our overall, respectfully, our, we're facing a number of mental, mental health issues on a number of fronts, and that's certainly a key aspect of addressing parts of it, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And frankly, it's, it's a complement to some of the other work that I have been doing specifically on mental health in a, a number of years ago now, um, through my work and collaboration actually with young people in our district. And then subsequent collaboration with the good folks at Samaritans. Mm -hmm. Yes. We created and funded with state dollars uh, the Hey Sam Youth Mental Health Text Line. Right. This is it's one of a kind, really. It is it is peer-to-peer, -peer, completely confidential, anonymous, um, and totally free. And anybody uh, up to you know in into your 20s even can text mm -hmm. Sam from wherever you are and get a trained peer responding back to you just to listen. And young people can text in, you know, if they're feeling stressed, all the way up to feeling suicidal, mm -hmm. uh, get the help that they need. And Hey Sam is saving lives. And that's, um, you know, that's a program that has resulted from my legislative leadership and collaborative approach to doing this job.
Um, we also just this past budget secured $50,000 to create an initial pilot program for purely substance-free and supportive housing for college students in recovery. Also a huge step forward and hopefully paving the path toward um, more policy advancements and legislative achievements specifically to support um, college students in recovery. Mm -hmm. So a lot of good good movement in that front as well. Um, I also passed nation-leading legislation um, this term to combat the dangers and harms of anti-choice so-called crisis, crisis pregnancy centers. Right. Um, these are intentionally deceptive centers that are certainly still here in Massachusetts. In fact, they outnumber the legitimate abortion clinics and reproductive care clinics by more than double, even in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, one of the ways that they lure in women seeking abortion care, even though they definitely do not provide abortion care, um, is by using the offer of a free ultrasound. Um, but often, most of the time, these anti-choice centers are not licensed healthcare facilities and they do not have any licensed healthcare providers on staff. Um, and so I wrote and passed law to require that all ultrasounds relating to pregnancies must be conducted under the supervision of a licensed healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. um, that is, frankly, an essential part of patient care and patient protection, um, and also an essential component of combating these anti-choice crisis pregnancy centers. Um, so a lot of really good things. Um, you know, also a, a bill to uh, modernize our birth certificates so that however many, if you have a single parent, there's just one line, there's no blank line on a birth certificate signifying... Mm -hmm even from the moment a child is born, that they're missing something, right? We know that's just not true. Um, and uh, for children with two moms or two dads or you know, two parents of whatever title you have, sure. um, that we're accurately reflecting um, every family, every beautiful family mm -hmm. in the Commonwealth, starting with our birth certificate documentation. Uh, right. So a little tweak, but it has a lot of impact for all sorts of families that have really previously gone unrecognized um, in some of our state documentation. And that's just, we can do better. And now we are doing better. Yeah, uh, I think that's the the key there. And I think summarizing a couple of themes that I've detected so far and what you've just kind of rolled through respectfully is that clearly you, you service, and I think it's what, in the 160 to 180 constituents in your district, while you have a party designation that doesn't apply to the service because you're servicing everybody and everybody matters to that extent in little ways, which is what you've been highlighting. Um, and some of the ways that potentially had been ignored and or overlooked because, well, that was the way we don't need to change that. Well, that was the way, this is the way we do it. Yeah. And asking in some of those may have come from, as you indicated, you know, constituent conversations, Hey, can we do this? Why is this? having those conversations and then crossing the aisle because there are some things that there should not be an aisle around. It's, it's, it's us. We need to do better. Let's, let's figure out how we can do better. Yeah. And we're doing that. Right. And, and so that's just kind of a, it's just a sampling even of, of some of our legislative and policy accomplishments. We didn't even talk about the plastics reduction act yet, which is the, you know, the most comprehensive single use plastics reduction legislation in the history of the Commonwealth that I wrote and architected, um, and, uh, and it is absolutely essential, essential to achieving our climate action goals, mm -hmm. both by 2030 and by 2050. And, you know, it's 2024, 2030 is coming really soon. It's not it's, that far away. You know, the, the plastics industry produces four times more um, harmful carbon emissions every year, four times more every year, than the airline industry. Mm. Isn't that wild? Right? A single plastic utensil can take up to 200 years to break down. 200 years, right? None of us are going to be around as long as that plastic no. fork. No. Right? And it's not going to go away. It's just going to break down into microplastics and nanoplastics. And we are already seeing those 
um, miniature plastic particles show up not just in the air and in the water and in the soil and in our plants, but also in wildlife and in human bodies. In in us, yes. In we, us. We, we are not aware of how much we already have. Yeah, it's uh it's really it's really a very big problem. And so in mm. order to address that, I mean we have to address waste management um and waste creation comprehensively, but we have got to get at single use plastics. Mm -hmm. Um that is what the Plastics Reduction Act would do. Bags, food service wear, plastic non-flushable wipes, those ones make a particular mess, pun intended. Yes. Um <laughs> and uh, and that was all part and parcel of the Plastics Reduction Act that was uh, I was able to shepherd through the Senate, um, working with my colleagues, also again across the aisle, um, and passed um, by a sweeping bipartisan vote of 38 to 2. Um, unfortunately, the House didn't pick that bill up this time around, so look forward to refiling that one come January with my colleagues in the house and uh, get the bill filed and hopefully we'll be able to get that one across the the ultimate finish line uh -huh. next but really significant progress um, made in a in a relatively short amount of time from a, a legislative perspective. Yeah, and respectfully, I think having participated in the citizen legislative forum earlier this year, um, thank you for that opportunity to do so. And on the one hand, I felt like it was underutilized to the extent that having been in the position that I have been, I've learned a lot about the process, but benefited clearly because it managed to tick and tie a lot of the loose ends. So now I have a much more confident feeling having seen the exact <laughs> way it operates, including a, 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 a pseudo session in the chambers itself, which was unique. Um, yeah. And now I can leverage that in my service and sharing the news, et cetera, because I'll know the behind the scenes that this really does happen. So you may have to refile it, but fortunately you've built some relationships. You've already got the documentation there. You're kind of like picking up and then going forward as opposed to going back to square zero and starting over. Right. Well, technically we still have to go back to square one from the legislative <laughs> process filing right. of the bill true but all the other work yes you're still yes. carrying forward you don't have to redo right. that yes that is completely right and i'm so glad that, that you um had such a wonderful experience in the citizens legislative seminar you know that is something the senate does annually um if people who are listening are interested they should in participating in that they should certainly reach out to my office and we will try to get them um you know in into the uh, into whatever the next upcoming one is. Um, but we are allowed to, uh, we are supported actually in, in bringing our constituents into the state house for, I think it's a two day process. Two day process, yep. Right, two days, two full days. And it's an incredibly immersive experience. Um, and that's just one part of, of the many different ways that I try to support um, both accountability and transparency and access to government. So much about government is just understanding how it works. <laughs> um, you know, it's why I'm so proud to be the Senate's um, you know, instrumental champion on civics education, right? Mm -hmm. We have civics education law, um, but we need to put money where our mouths were back in 2018. And uh, for the last two years, I have been able to champion um, budget legislative activity to ensure that we have two and a half million dollars set aside explicitly for civics education, mm -hmm. uh, right? Absolutely essential. And it's working. I'm seeing the results of it by the students from, especially from our district, but even all across the Commonwealth because sure. I'm the chair of the environmental committee. And so I get a lot of activity on that and, um, or people are interested in my abortion legislation, you know, abortion access legislation. They write to me about that. I'm, I'm seeing it. You know, I visit students. I think I've met with more than a thousand students this session, mm. um, both in the state house and in their classrooms. And I have a a whole presentation, a deck that I you know present to them that includes a government tic tac toe, right? How does it work? Right. Who, who are the various people in which levels of government and which branches, and how do they all work together? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's designed to both engage students and also to enhance and supplement the civics education that they're already getting um, through our statewide curriculum. Um, and yeah, I think uh, while on that topic, particularly with the kids and the youth, you have a youth forum that you do periodically. I think there's another one coming up this month. 
Yeah, there's one coming up on the 21st, actually, in the evening. I'm going to call it my calendar while we're talking so I can make sure to get it right. It is Monday, October 21st at 6 p.m., and that is virtual. Um, so young, you know, young people often don't ha- don't drive yet at all. And even if they do, they might not have access to a car. And so right. you know, we're lining from COVID. We learned how to do things remotely. Um, and one of those things is my... Uh, youth fall town hall. And we actually just wrapped up my um, annual in-person fall town hall series, um, which we do in September. Um, And we also have office hours every single month and they alternate between in-person and And virtual. virtual, So people can choose whatever, you know, whatever method and platform works best for them. Um, It's just, you know, and, and, and that's to say nothing of being in community at the Harvest Festival and the Strawberry Stroll and uh, you know, any just... number of event opportunities, not just here in Franklin, but throughout your what 11, 12 community cities, communities. Yeah, 11, 11 towns. Yeah, I was just in Sherburne last weekend for their amazing 350th anniversary celebrations. Mm. It's fun to think that any town is 350 years old in this country. Um, but they are, they, they just, you know, happy birthday, Sherburn. Um, and, uh, they had a tremendous set of celebrations. Rentham had a big anniversary celebration yes. last year. Yep. And for each of those, I've been able to secure funding from the state to support those local community initiatives. Um, and that's a, that's a real honor. It's a, and it's such a joy to be able to support, um, constituents and communities in those ways. So while you've touted accomplishments, some of your priorities, I'm assuming you still have some things to do more. <laughs> <laughs> some other things that are still left on your to-do list. So many things still to do. Um, in many ways, building on on the accomplishments that we've already notched, uh, right. right? Getting that Plastics Reduction Act over the ultimate finish line, um, providing that insurance coverage um, for all post-pregnancy mental health care, not just the screenings. I passed a bill to repeal our still on the books, <laughs> grossly outdated and very likely unconstitutional um, legislation that criminalizes blasphemy. Um, yep, that's still a crime in Massachusetts. It's been repealed in all of the other states in the nation except for five, and we are one of those five. Mm-hmm. Uh, Senate passed that, but the House didn't pick it up. So we, you know, we still have some work to do there. Right. Um, so many of these pieces where we've gotten part of the way we need to get them all of the way um and uh and that also includes things like my community immunity act which um is a robust um public health um infectious disease infrastructure legislation mm-hmm. um it's really about data and information and and providing support to people in community um so that we've we've been able to advance that at various different points in various different uh, ways over the years and not over the finish line yet. So we're going to keep well, it. It's, it's one that unfortunately still keeps coming up between the nefarious folks out there trying to scam, spam, do something to get at somebody. It, it's something that clearly, I'm not sure that one, any respectfully, any one particular thing, but any, anything can help because it is right. just, it, it's out there in, in so many aspects of that. Right. I mean, we're going to have a lot of work to do. I think, probably for the rest of our lifetimes to Mm -hmm. improve public health infrastructure. And this is one very important, um, but, but one piece of the comprehensive public health puzzle. Right. Uh, And we do need to keep working on that. Um, And then a whole slew of bills on election reform and continuing to ensure voting access, updating our central registry of voters, all sorts of things on the back end of um, voting and good democracy, closing a loophole in our lobbying law, um, where we want to make sure that we we don't have nefarious actors engaging in lobbying in the in the state. We have a free market economy. That's one thing. That's all well and good. But let's make sure the market is working for us and not against us. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then especially important recently, I have a bill to establish a right to freedom from doxing, mm. and that we just we just have to pass that. We just have to pass that. It is so harmful and so toxic, especially for young people. And we continue to see it. And it's just, it's inexcusable. It's just inexcusable. I don't know what your, whatever your issue is, doxing is not the solution to that problem. 
Um, so we got to pass that bill. Um, and then, uh, you know, a number of other pieces that we need to continue to work on. And we are doing, uh, we are in the development stage for a number of new pieces of legislation um, that I'll look forward to uh, to sharing more about in the coming months when we coming months. Sure. Yeah, we'll get closer to uh, to filing and, and also to finalizing sort of what we want these pieces to look like. But, but all along the same themes um, that I've been working on for years, right? Uplifting people, providing safety and security, um, you know, supporting folks, improving access to healthcare and education and, um, you know, affordability to, related to that, of course. Yes. First affordability, right. Yeah. Trying to make people's lives a little bit better, a little bit easier, and hopefully a little bit less expensive. Yes. Well, thank you for taking time to share. I hope the listeners will appreciate that. And of course, you know, follow appropriately and whatever social channels they may follow you and clearly get out to vote on or before <laughs> November 5th. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Steve. Well, thank you again for taking time. For the listeners, quick reminder, we do this because Franklin matters. We are now producing this in collaboration with Franklin TV and Franklin Public Radio. This podcast is my public service effort for Franklin, but we can't do it alone. We can always use your help. How can you help? If you can use the information that you find here, please tell your friends and neighbors. If you don't like something here, please let me know. Through this feedback loop, we can continue to make improvements. And I thank you for listening. For additional information, please visit franklinmatters.org. If you have questions or comments, you can reach me directly at suresteve at gmail.com. The music for the intro and exit was provided by Michael Clark and the group East of Shirley. The piece is titled Ernesto Manana, copyright Michael Clark and Tin Type Tunes in 2008, and used with their permission. I hope you enjoy. And by the way, you can also subscribe and listen to Franklin Matters Radio on your favorite podcast app.